uncertain, to have uncertainty of our nation. Uh, we should pray and pray for our authorities, pray for this election and, and pray that God would move upon this country to make it again, uh, if it ever was, a nation under God. Um, if you would stand with me and sing, we're going to sing Heaven Came Down. Um, but first I want to read uh, Romans 4. It says 8 in here, but I'm going to read 7 and 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not count his sin. What a blessed truth of the Bible. Let us sing. There's going to be a freedom celebration that we've been invited to. Grace Baptist Church uh, is, is, I guess, organizing this event. It's at uh, Travis Price Park from 4 to 9 p.m. this evening. So it's a free family event. We'll feature food, inflatables, fireworks show, and a concert by for King and Country, which is a Christian band, and the Devin Williams Band. The concert begins at 7.30 p.m. So as you can visit a website, look in your, uh, your bulletin for that announcement. So, of course, 4th of July, Monday. We're thankful, right, to be in a country which is still more free than the majority of the world. It's not perhaps the country we were born into, and that's changing pretty quickly. 
but be grateful for the grace God has given us where he's placed us. So let us pray this morning for our services. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. Father, we've all come uh, from a week, this last week, where we may have had struggles, um, Father, untold problems. Um, Father, we need to look to you always. Father, in these turbulent times, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, always interceding for us, always mindful of your children. And uh, Father, we thank you for the gospel, that while we were yet dead in our sins and trespasses, you sent Jesus Christ, the godly for the ungodly, to die upon the cross because of our sins. And you raised him as proof of his righteousness, and he's ascended as proof of his righteousness, and he lives today. Father, we thank you for the gospel. It is good news. It is always good news, no matter how bad the news may appear in our city, in our, our areas. Father, you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. And we pray that this day you be glorified in the proclamation of your word. As we study more about salvation, what you've done for us, so great a salvation. For your brother Rick, as he proclaims your truth this day, Holy Spirit, convict us of our sins, conform us to the image of Christ. None of us can stand here today and boast of anything apart from Jesus Christ. May you be glorified in everything said, done, and sung here this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would stand and uh, greet one another in the name of the Lord. Condense, bid me, and depart. Um, as you make your way back to the, the seat, uh, we're going to sing Power of the Cross. Um, of course, this is why we have salvation. Today we're going to be talking about the doctrine of salvation, and this is why. Because Jesus Christ came in our place, took upon our sins, and, and died, was buried, and risen again. Let us sing of that glorious fact.
reading for us this morning a uh, kind of con- condensed version of uh, part four of our Baptist faith and message, which is on salvation. Uh, Brother Rick will be reading this in full detail during the sermon. It says, salvation involves the redemption of the whole man and is offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who by his own blood obtained eternal redemption for the believer. In its broadest sense, salvation includes regeneration, justification, sanctification, and glorification. There is no no salvation apart from personal faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. This will be our offertory hymn, so ushers prepare. And you may remain seated at this at the Calvary, which is two forty five in the hymnal. <clears throat> to you whatever we may. And it, please give us the strength and the guidance that we need for the rest of the week. And I ask this through Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. If you have your Bibles, you can be turning to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we'll stand as our, our new custom for the reading of God's Word. If you're able to stand, please stand. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Lord and God, we just pray that your word will go forth today. Lord, that you would bless it. Just feed our souls. And we pray that Christ would be preeminent. In his name we pray. Amen. Why are we not in hell right now? I don't know if you've ever thought of that. I think of that sometimes. Why am I not in hell right now? Hell is a populated place. I don't know if you realize that. There are people in hell right now, and we deserve to be there. Why are we not there right now? Why are we saved? Why is it that we are born-again believers? And not only that, I think of this oftentimes as well. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why do we gather here Sunday after Sunday? Why do we come on Wednesday nights? Why do we read our Bibles? Why do we evangelize? Why do we do the things that we do? And not only that, how do we do the things that we do? Because we know it's not easy. We know we cannot do them in our own power. It's all because of the grace of God. It's only by God's grace that we are not in hell. It's only by God's grace that we are here this morning, that we desire to be here, that we have a hunger and a desire for his word and for fellowship and for, for communing with him. It's the grace of God. Some other questions we need to ponder. Why do we need saving? We know we're saved by the grace of God, but why do we need to be saved? And what are we saved from? I don't know if you've ever thought of that. What are we saved from? If you ask the average person, the average believer, what they're saved from, what will their response probably be? It will be hell. We're saved from hell. But that's not necessarily what the Bible pictures that we're saved from. Um, some people might say sin, and that's true to, to a degree. We are saved from hell. We are saved from our sin. But ultimately, we are saved from God himself. God saves us from himself, by himself, and for himself. Salvation is all of God, and it's all of God's grace. So when somebody asks you why you're saved or, or what you're saved from, you say you're saved from God. Yes, we're saved from the penalty of our sin. Yes, we're saved from, from God's judgment. But ultimately, we are saved from God, by God, and for God. It's all of God. Is it really that bad? Do we need to be saved? Uh, I'm, I'm going to paint, paint a pretty dark picture here. Is it really that bad? Yes. Um, we cannot even begin to understand the depth of our sin, um, let alone the holiness of God. Um, we don't think, we don't meditate on these enough. We don't focus on our sin enough. We don't know who God is, and we, we cannot even begin to comprehend His holiness and how unlike He, he is from us and how much He hates our sin. But uh, let's go back to Genesis 3 in our minds. You don't have to turn there. Let's go back to the beginning. Pastor Chad uh, preached on the doctrine of man last week, and this obviously builds, I don't know if, if you've been reading and studying the Baptist faith, the message, there's a progression. Um, we don't get to salvation until we've, we have covered the doctrine of man. We have to see who man is and why he needs saving before we can tackle the doctrine of salvation. So when we go back to, to Genesis 3 from last week's sermon, and, and just in our minds, we understand and, and we find that God made man upright. Um, when you go back to Eden, you see, man, he's perfect. He's without sin. He's walking with God, a luxury we do not have today. Physically, we do not walk um, with Christ or with our God. He was without sin. What was that even like? There's nothing that we can compare that to because we are born sinners. All we have known our entire lives is sin. We cannot even begin to fathom what it would be like to walk in God's presence without sin. But Adam did that. But we also found out in Genesis 3 and from the sermon last week, from the doctrine of man, he did not stay in that condition very long. He was created upright by God, but then he fell. And how far was that? 
that fall. Biblically, uh, um, spiritually speaking, it was very far. Um, we, we use words now, uh, and Genesis 3 describes them, that Adam fell and his wife fell. Uh, they are now spiritually dead. You see that in Genesis 3. You see that his nature was changed or transformed. He died spiritually. Everything changed about him. He now desired sin instead of that communion with God and that closeness. Um, him and his wife were filled with shame. Um, they knew of their nakedness now, something that they did not have an have a experiential knowledge of. Not only that, they ran from God. And in running from God, they tried to cover their sin. And in covering their sin, they invented religion, man-made religion, trying to get God's favor, trying to earn salvation, trying to make things right with my own power and my own doing. Not only that, it gets worse. He avoided responsibility. What did he do when he was questioned by God? He passed the book. He actually blamed God if you read the text. It's the woman that you gave me, God, that made me sin, that, that caused all this to be. He avoided responsibility. Not only that, he is now unable to not sin. Adam fell, and he is a sinner completely through and through. He is utterly depraved. He is unable to stop sinning. If you've ever thought of it, we are, now as believers, we have the, the, the opportunity, the possibility to not sin. We're still sin, sinners. We're still sinful. We still have the flesh. But through the, the leading and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, when tempted, we don't have to sin. We often do, but we don't have to. Only because we're redeemed. Unredeemed Adam was unable not to sin. It is his nature now to sin, and you cannot go against your nature. If you've ever thought of it like this, sinning is the easiest thing we can do. We do it so naturally. It just comes natural to us. We sin, and we cannot stop sinning apart from Christ. Not only that, Genesis 3 teaches that Adam and us are corrupt, we're polluted, we're depraved, we're rebellious, we're separated from God, we're even haters of God, and ultimately we are enemies of God. That is the dark picture that Scripture paints for the doctrine of man. Created upright, but now he fell. And how great was that fall? It was great. It was huge. But God, even in Genesis 3, God intervenes. When you go back to the text, you find out what does he do? He sacrifices animals. He covers their nakedness. He forgave them. He promised salvation. He poured out grace upon grace. So how great was the fall? It was tremendous. It was great. It was horrific. But God, and God interceded. Why do I rehearse this? Why do we go back to Genesis 3? Why do we go back to the, to the doctrine of man? I cannot sum it up any better than the Puritan pastor William Bates. He says, The wretchedness of man, the wretchedness of our captivity illustrates the glory of our redemption. When we see how far we fell, when we realize how God has saved us and what he has done to save us, who we are now in Christ, it, it just paints a, a bigger and a better and a more brilliant and glorious picture. When you put God's grace against the back, the black backdrop of sin, it's just that much more magnificent. So salvation was initiated by God in Genesis 3, and it's still initiated by God even today in our scripture here. Man could not figure this out. I find this very intriguing that Adam, when he fell, he tried to save himself, and he did it wrong. He went about it the wrong way. It was God that initiated salvation. God had to reveal something to sinful man in order for him to be saved. And we've talked about this the past um, couple sermon series, and it's going to come up again. Is there salvation apart from scripture? Um, specific revelation. Uh, Brother Garrett mentioned it this morning. We cannot be saved apart from God's word, God's special revelation. If that was so, surely freshly fallen Adam would have been able to figure it out. Him who is in God's presence, him who had just walked with God and talked to God, who was just perfect moments before, he could not figure it out. Why do we think that we can look at creation and figure out a way to save ourselves? It's impossible. We need scripture. We need the gospel. We need need God to make it known to us because why salvation belongs to the Lord it's not in our power to save ourselves it's not invented by us we cannot do it we are unable to save ourselves salvation belongs to the to the Lord 
Man, by his fall, now is unholy and he's unlo- unlike God. So what does he need? He needs to be sanctified. He needs to be made like God. He is now dead spiritually and needs to be called and regenerated. This is getting to our text. We'll get there. Um, he is now unrighteous and we are guilty before a holy and a sin-hating God. So we need to be justified. We need to be acquitted of our sin. And not only that, man by his fall is headed for hell and damnation and needs to be perfected and kept for glory. These are our needs. This is what scripture paints as the needs for sinners. We need these things. It's it's not something we want. It's a need. We need these things. And it is a great need and God meets these needs for us. Again, we cannot do it for ourselves. Man is powerless and unable to make himself holy, raise himself from the dead, acquit himself of guilt and sin, and completely transform his nature or remove the remnant of sin. How can I do that? I can't. It is impossible with me. I cannot raise myself from spiritual deadness, change my nature from, from hating sin to now hate, or from loving sin to hating sin and hating God to loving sin. This is not something that is in our power to do. But God can do it, and he does do it. We see it. It's evidence in our own lives, and we see it day to day when other Christians gather, when we share the gospel, when people are converted. Salvation again. What is it? How do we define salvation going forward? We are saved by God, from God, and for God. God gets all the glory. In our text, we have salvation from God's point of view, and it is great. It is amazing. When we look at this passage, when we boil it down, when we break it up, and unpack it, um, we are truly going to see God's great salvation. So let's get started. Number one, the goal of salvation is found in, in verse 29. God has a goal in salvation. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. First of all, the goal of salvation for the saints. In verse 29a, For those whom he foreknew, we have to remember, we have to try to wrap our minds around this, that God initiated salvation. Um, Adam, if you remember, going back to Genesis 3, salvation was at the farthest from his mind. He was only interested in covering his nakedness. He was not concerned with salvation or being separated from God. He did not have that, that knowledge yet or just what was going on. He could not figure it out. It was initiated by God. So what does this word foreknow mean or to foreknew? or that God foreknew. Um, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. What does it mean? We have to remember the context of the entire book of Romans. Paul is writing to sinners, and he says very clearly that we're under the wrath of God. We're depraved. We do not seek after God. We do not love God, and we are effortless and powerless to save ourselves. The law cannot save us. We cannot save ourselves. So in this context... What does this word foreknew or to foreknow mean? It means, quite simply, that God set his affections on a sinful people. He, it is a distinguishing love. He loved people beforehand. It's an intimate uh, term. It implies ownership. He knew somebody beforehand. He owns them. And it means to delight in, to love, to set his affections on, to mark out beforehand. In scripture, it simply does not mean that he had a knowledge of a person. I know people. This is not the same term. When used in scripture, it means to to know, to love, to cherish. It's often used in scripture as a relational term. Adam knew his wife. Um, they had relations. There's a closeness. There's an intimacy. And when you put the, uh, the, the, um, the, the prefix for upon it, it means that God loved a people beforehand. He set his affections on them. He chose them. He loved them. He selected them. And what did he love them beforehand? Or why did he know them or, or choose to select them? So, Our text tells us he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He knew a a people ahead of time for a purpose, the text tells us. It is that those whom God loved intimately, he predestined. What does this predestination mean? We'll, We'll get to it actually more next week, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but it quite simply, it means simply, predestined means to determine the destination beforehand, just like it says. There's a destination. God determined it beforehand, and we'll unpack this here in a minute. Now, this raises a lot of questions, and I know that. I knew that getting into this text. We've talked about it before. We've wrestled with it, but it has to be dealt with. The doctrine of predestination, the doctrine of election, we're not going to dot all the I's this morning. We're not going to figure out all the ins and outs. 
But we do have to realize that it is in Scripture and it has to be dealt with. However you interpret it, however you want to go forward from this, we have to deal with it. We cannot just skirt it. We cannot just forget about it. It has to be dealt with. We have to talk about it. It's in Scripture, and it has everything to do with God's salvation. We're learning about God's salvation this morning. We see it in our text. We see it in other texts. We, are, we have been foreknown by God and predestined by God for something, and we'll unpack that here in a minute. So it has something to do with our salvation, God's salvation. So it has to be dealt with. Now, in going forward, in realizing this, we also have to realize that this is God's Word, and it's true no matter how it makes us feel. We do not interpret Scripture <clears throat> according to our feelings. Our feelings are not our hermeneutic. We do not read a passage of Scripture and say, well, I don't like that very much. It doesn't make me feel very good or warm and fuzzy, so I'm going to interpret it this way. That is not how we approach Scripture. We read Scripture, and it says what God says it says. And we interpret Scripture with Scripture, and we see this teaching all throughout Scripture. And no matter how it makes us feel, if we hate it, if we love it, whatever, it does not matter. It's still going to be true regardless of how we feel about this doctrine of election and this doctrine of predestination. So it has to be handled. John Calvin, in his, in his commentary on Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse 6, he said, All who would do away with God's predestination or are loath to hear it spoken of, thereby show themselves to be mortal enemies of God's praise. And if you go back to Ephesians chapter 1, when you read it in context, um, over and over Paul says that God destined people. He elected people. Why? For the glory of his grace. He did it so he would be honored and he would be glorified. And John Calvin and others like him have said, if, if we try to skirt around this doctrine, if we try to water it down if we just ignore it what we're really doing is saying we don't care about God's glory because God chose to honor or to select and predestine the people for his glory so if we don't like it we're just saying well you know God I'm not worried about your glory in this instance so obviously it has to be dealt with but we can be patient we can be kind um, we don't pe beat people over the head with it we're very understanding but it does have to be dealt with we also must keep in mind that salvation is all of grace it's all of grace when you look at, at the Bible and see how dead we were how unholy how unrighteous we were we were not going to choose God unless God did something we would still be dead in our sin and we would be in hell but it's only by the grace of God that we are not there right now this means that we don't deserve it it means that we love sin that we hate God um, that we would hate heaven if we were in heaven right now if we were not born again believers we would hate heaven that's what this sinfulness means that means why we need to be saved by grace it also means that we're headed for hell that we're doomed that we're damned we need God to save us, and it's all of grace. We weren't looking for it. We didn't deserve it. Uh, we could not pay God back for it. We didn't desire it. So, but notice what the people that God foreknew are destined for. In our text, he said, for those whom he foreknew. He knew somebody. He put his affections. He loved somebody beforehand. And what did he predestine them for? To be conformed to the image of his son. He knew a per people beforehand, set his love uh, upon them, elected them for salvation, predestined them for what? To be conformed to his, the image of his son. This is the doctrine of sanctification. That is the purpose of God's, uh, of God's salvation. That is the purpose of God's goal. God doesn't save just to save. It's not just willy-nilly. He's not just selecting people and, and doing this. His salvation results in believers becoming like Christ. He has a purpose and end in it and we'll even unpack it further in the baptist faith message not yet sorry well we can go ahead and read it and the doctrine of sanctification sanctification is the experience on page 11 beginning in regeneration by which the believer is set apart to god's purposes and is enabled to progress towards moral and spiritual maturity through the presence and power of the holy spirit dwelling in him growth and grace should continue throughout the regenerate person's life that is why god saved us that's one of his goals of salvation <laughs> is so that we would be perfected that we would be like his son jesus christ that's the purpose so being predestined 
to be conformed to the image of Christ means something. And, and before I go forward, we, we get tripped up again, going back to the doctrine of election and doctrine of predestination. We say it's unfair, you know, this and that. But when you read what we're predestined for, what it means to be conformed to the image of Christ, that in, in itself is not necessary. It's a beautiful picture, don't get me wrong, but it's painful. And let me, let me explain it this way. Being predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ means that we are going to be humbled that we are going to be broken, that we are going to be convicted over our sin. It is hurtful, it is painful. It also means that we are going to bear the cross in shame. If we are to be conformed more into the image of Christ, that means we are to act like Christ and be like Christ. That means bearing the cross, dying to self, maybe even dying physically, and bearing shame. It also means suffering. We are going to suffer like the Lord Jesus Christ suffered. That's how God perfects us and makes us more like, like his son. Again, it might be willing, be made willing to die in order to be like Christ. So we are predestined for this. This is going to happen. We experience this day to day, this being humbled and broken. Oftentimes we do endure ridicule from the lost, from the world. They don't understand us. But this is what God chose us for and predestined us for to be made more into the image of his son. And this path to glory must pass through the valley. We understand that as Christians. It doesn't make it any easier. It's still very painful. It still hurts. But we know that glory is on that side. And to get there, we have to go through the valley. There's going to be loss. There's going to be hurt. There's going to be bumps and bruises along the way. But this is God's plan for us to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. So to apply this, you might be sitting there and you might say, this is just wow. I'm just blown away by God's word and this doctrine, this teaching. Does it apply to us? It most certainly does. Christian, are you suffering today? Are you suffering? Are you wrestling with sin? Do you wake up in the morning? Do you just find it hard to get going? Sometimes you just don't feel like being a Christian. You just don't want to get out of bed. You just want to hide under the covers. You don't want to be ridiculed. You're just tired of sinning against the holy God. You don't feel like reading your Bible. It's just hard to be alive. Have you ever been there? Are you suffering for your faith? Well, take heart. You are being perfected. This is part of God's plan for you. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it's not easy. Nobody wants to be humbled and broken, but God is forming you. He's conforming you more into the image of Christ. This is his plan, and we know when we wrestle, when we suffer, that God can use even those things for our good and for his glory. Not only that, it does no good to bemoan or complain about our present sufferings. We, of all people, myself included, I'm just being honest, I love to complain. It's the easiest thing to do instead of doing something about it. It's just a lot easier just to complain and to bemoan circumstances or what. I have a flat tire on my car at, at home right now. After church, I'm going to have to go to sit at Walmart for probably three hours while they fix my tire. I'm not looking forward to that. I'm complaining about it. But it does no good because, again, these are sanctifying moments and God can use them. So it does no good to bemoan or, or to complain against our sufferings unless, of course, we are not willing to bear the image of Christ. So when we complain, when we bemoan just what's going on around us, instead of saying, you know, why God, we should all be saying, and we know this, what are you trying to teach me, God? So when we complain, when we gripe, what we're actually saying is, I don't want to bear the image of Christ. This is not worth it. This is too hard. How is this going to make me more like my Lord and Savior going forward? And not only that, we also are disapproving of God's plan. We're saying, you know, God, this is not right. Um, I don't know. Just do it a different way. This is not how I want to grow. This is not how I want my salvation to come fruition. If it's this hard to be made like Christ, man, just forget it today kind of thing. We have that attitude. But there is a purpose in all of the pain. God is shaping us and conforming us more into the image of his son. God's plan for his people is to be holy and to be like Christ, to be fitted for heaven, but ultimately to glorify Christ. And we see this in our text. Um, point B under this 
we see the goal of salvation for the saints. Um, secondly, in, in the end of verse 29, we see the goal of salvation for the Son. Why did God foreknow people and predestine people to be conformed into the image of his Son? Why did he do this? In order that he, Jesus Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. He has this plan in place so that Christ will be preeminent. And how does he go about doing this? He has made him the firstborn which speaks of a priority and a supremacy of Christ. It speaks of Christ being exalted above all else, above all creation. Christ is preeminent, and not only that, he is exalt, uh, exalted among many brothers. And this is just huge. When, when, when we try to, to wrap our minds around this, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. If we are a Christian here today, we are the brother of Christ. We are united to him. It shows an intimacy and a union with him uh, between us. We are united to him. We are part of him. We are now sons of God, brothers of Christ. And not only that, we enjoy this communion with him and a community with other brothers. Christ included. We, we commune, we fellowship, we gather, we worship our Christ together, and, and as such, we are sons of God. We have been adopted and brought into God's family. So God set his love on sinners, predestined them to be conformed to the image of his Son for the glory of the Son. That's the goal of salvation, so Christ would be honored and glorified in all things. That's why we were chosen beforehand. That's why God set his love and affections on us. That's why he predestined us to be conformed to the image of Christ, which includes all the bad days, all the bumps, all the car wrecks, the cancer, the sickness, the disease, the flat tires, you name it. All of that was destined by God, ordained by God, to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ, so that Christ will be elevated and exalted and preeminent and worshipped above all else. We are sinners turned to saints, turned into sons, all for Christ's glory. All for Christ's glory. That word all is all-encompassing. It encompasses everything. We don't have time, but you can go back to verse um, 28 in, in our text, our context, and, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. And then Paul unpacks that. All things work together for the good. All things. Sickness, cancer, everything. Salvation is for our good, but ultimately, and more importantly, it is for Christ's glory. I want to read a passage from Revelation chapter 5 that illustrates this. What's going on in heaven right now? Verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom of, and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and <clears throat> all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Christ is being worshipped. And if you know the context of Revelation, something obviously we have no time to get into right now. Um, these Most times in the book of Revelation, there's several chapters like this where, where Christ and God is being praised. And in many of the instances, it's by martyrs. It's by people who have suffered death, suffered for the sake of the gospel, have been beheaded even, and now they are in glory proclaiming and worshiping um, the worth of Christ and bowing down and casting their crowns before him and just crying out in exaltation over who Christ is and what he has done. People that actually died for the faith were perfected, were sanctified, set apart, going through life, bumps and bruises, even lopping their heads off. Now they are before the throne and it all means something. Now it has all come together. So we see the goal of salvation, but what is this salvation? We see the goal. We know that God has a plan and a purpose for it. What is it? Verse 30, the gift of salvation. Back in Romans chapter 8, verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Salvation involves 
page 11 in the Baptist Catechism, or Confession of Faith that Brother Garrett read this morning. Salvation involves the redemption of the whole man and is offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who by his own blood obtained eternal redemption for the believer. In its broadest sense, salvation includes regeneration, justification, sanctification, which we already talked about, and glorification. There is no salvation apart from personal faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ as Lord. Notice something, that it's only those who were predestined that are called. In our text, it's those who God foreknew, he predestined, and those whom he predestined, he called. Also notice the he in this. He called, he justified, he glorified. God, again, is the initiator of this salvation. Salvation belongs to the, to the Lord. But also note the depth of this salvation. As we unpack these terms and what they mean, we just see that every need that we had that happened in Genesis 3, everything we lost is given back to us as, 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 through this salvation. Every need is meant. So first of all, in verse 30a, um, we are called. And those whom he predestined, he also called. This calling is the internal call of God. It's a drawing, it's a wooing, it's a, it's a summoning. Um, the Bible is replete with references on this. I'll read a few. Um, John chapter 6 and verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. It's a drawing, it's a wooing. And I will raise him up on the last day. John chapter 10 verse 3. To him the, the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them. He calls out to them, and he leads them. They follow. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Those who were predestined are called by God. He, he calls them in time. And this includes regeneration. I'm going back to our confession of faith, the doctrine of rege uh, regeneration, or the new birth is a work of God's grace whereby believers become new creatures in Jesus Christ. They're regenerated. They're made alive. It is a change of heart wrought by the Holy Spirit through conviction of sin to which the sinner responds in repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith are inseparable experiences of grace. Repentance is a genuine turning from sin sin toward God. Faith is the acceptance of Jesus Christ and commitment to the entire personality of, to him as Lord and Savior. This includes regeneration. So when we go back to Genesis 3, when we remember who we are in Adam and what happened in the fall, just as Adam died spiritually, he was called on by God. God initiated salvation. He went to them, and he actually gave them the sacrifice or sacrifice and clothed their nakedness. We are spiritually dead sinners as well, and God calls us. He raises us to new life in Jesus Christ. We are now born again. He calls us, and he gives us the ability to respond by raising us from the dead. Let me read a passage for you in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made al us alive together with Christ. He made us alive in Christ. Made us alive together in Christ by grace who have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So we were raised from spiritual deadness. We were caused to be born again. Um, John chapter 3, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 talk about these things, how we are, are raised to new life. They, we, uh, when we're raised to do new life, we hear the gospel call and we're enabled to respond. God calls out in the gospel, come to me, repent, trust in Christ for salvation. And those whom he foreknew and he predestines, he gives them that ability. He makes them born again. He regenerates them, <laughs> gives them a new heart that now cries out for forgiveness. Now it's broken over their sin, our sin. We hate our sin. And now we want to embrace Christ for deliverance. We want this salvation because we know we need saving. We have been called. We've heard the voice of Christ. Notice the progression again in our text. It's only those who he foreknew, that he predestined, that he called. Why? Because he loved them and desired to redeem them so that they will become Christ-like in order for Christ to be preeminent and glorified. Salvation is not about us. It's all about God. It's all about Christ um, and getting all the glory. This is God's work. 
When we cannot call ourselves, a spiritually dead man cannot make himself alive or hear. We cannot make ourselves hear the, the internal call of the Holy Spirit. It's something that he does. We cannot change our nature or replace our heart of stone with a heart of flesh. We simply cannot do this. Those who are called respond and only respond because God has first acted. God gets all the glory. There is absolutely no room for any man anywhere to boast about their salvation. All we did was, was lay motionless, dead, and God called us, raised us up to life, and gave us the ability to cry out in repentance and faith. Why? Why, Why do we talk about this? Is this applicable to our lives? In order to hear the internal call of God, the gospel must be proclaimed. The, God, the, the Bible makes clear that there's two calls. The one external, through the proclamation of the gospel, calling sinners to repent, calling sinners to, to turn to Christ, to be forgiven. But then there's the internal call of the Holy Spirit. Once the gospel goes out, the Spirit does His work. So how does that apply to us? We realize that the external call of the gospel has to go out. We have to call people to salvation, and then the Holy Spirit does his work. So that's why we preach. That's why we teach. That's why we visit. That's why we evangelize. That's why we fly halfway across the world and, and sweat for, for 10 days to preach and teach the gospel. That's why we give money. That's why we feed the football team. That's why we go to the nursing home. That's why we go to the abortion clinic. And that is why we do the things that we do because the external call of the gospel has to go out, has to go forth. Nobody is going to be saved apart from scripture, apart from the gospel. We have laid that foundation. And if that's the case, that's why we do what we do. That's why we have to keep doing what we are doing. That is the only help or hope, I'm sorry, the only hope of a lost and dying world is the gospel. We talked about it this morning. That is our responsibility. That is our privilege to send out the gospel, to preach and teach the gospel, to share the gospel with, with them, to give that external call. So yes, this is applicable. That's why we do what we do. Secondly, the second gift it is found also in verse 30, um, section B. And those whom he called, he also justified. Justification is God's declaration that sinners are righteous in Christ and stand forgiven. We, are stand, we stand as forgiven. The Baptist faith and message, again on page 11. Justification is God's gracious and full acquittal upon principles of his righteousness of all sinners who repent and believe in Christ. Justification brings the believer unto a relationship of peace and favor with God. Um, obviously, this is a huge doctrine. We cannot unpack it all this morning. I'm just going to bring out some highlights. What this means for us is that our sin was placed on Christ, and Christ's perfect righteousness is given to us. Um, there was a transaction that took place. Christ received our sins. We receive his, his righteousness uh, upon repentance and faith. God justifies us. We have to be righteous before a holy God to be, to be saved, to be allowed into heaven, to be in God's presence. Again, we cannot make this ourselves. We cannot produce this righteousness. We cannot stop sinning. We need something outside of ourselves to, to make us righteous to declare us righteous. And it's only the righteousness of Christ that will do. Christ is a perfect sacrifice. So again, a transaction took place. Another word for this, which is key, is imputation. I know that sounds like a big word, but it's key. Um, sin, Christ is not a sinner, mind you, but our sins were given to him or placed in his account, imputed to him, just as we are not righteous. His righteousness is given to us or imputed to us. So we stand covered. What, what this means, if we have been foreknown and predestined and called, we now stand in God's presence. He is the perfect judge. We are declared not guilty. Just, just think, on your, think to yourself as we're on trial for being a sinner. And God is the judge. He's the perfect judge, the righteous judge. We are unrighteous. But now, because we have been justified, we are made righteous. We are declared righteous because of what Christ has done is given to us as a gift. So we're covered with it. Martin Luther, the famous reformer, um, he lived in Germany, for the, you, the, uh, those who don't know, in the 1500s. And I guess back then, um, they had a lot of fields, a lot of things. They would have huge dung piles just to fertilize the field. And one day, he, he was walking, and it was winter, and uh, he knew the dung piles were there, because I guess the day before, 
He was walking in this, this uh, it snowed the night before. So he was walking his, his usual path, and all these dung piles were just covered with just the perfect whitest blanket of snow. And he said, that is a picture of justification. We are dung piles. We deserve God's wrath and, and hell, but we're covered with just that perfect blanket, that righteousness of Christ, and we're now white. We're pure. We're not, but Christ's righteousness is given to us. So what this means is that we are not guilty anymore before God, that he acquitted us of our sins and our debt. We go free because of what Christ has done in our place what he bore, he bore God's wrath, and now we are covered with his righteousness. We are now righteous before God, something we cannot produce, but God sees us as righteous because everything that belongs to Christ is now ours. We are united to him. Remember that unification and that brotherhood that we, we talked about. We are so close to Christ right now. Everything that is his is ours. So we stand before God as acquitted and righteous. Adam stood condemned. Going back to the garden to tie all this together, Adam stood condemned. He could do nothing to cover his nakedness or his shame or do away with his sin, but God covered it. He killed those animals, which is a foreshadow of Christ and his perfect sacrifice, and now us, we who are called and regenerated, we now are forgiven and declared righteous because of what Christ has done. Paul, in our chapter, verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Adam stood condemned. He was covered by a sacrifice. We stood condemned. Now we go free. We're not condemned any longer because Christ and his blood and his righteousness covers us and washes us. Does this apply to us? This is a lot of doctrine, I know, but is there application for us? Of course there is. There is hope for sinners. God does pardon and forgive sinners that repent and trust in his son for salvation alone. That's the application. People can go free. They can be acquitted of their guilt and their sin. And not only that, you as a believer, you may be assured of your salvation. We know that we have been acquitted because God has said it. If we have been foreknown by God, predestined, we're being sanctified, we've been called out, we heard the call, we know and trust that we are forgiven, that Christ's righteousness abides on us. So we must not punish ourselves or feel guilty over our sin anymore because it does not exist. We have been forgiven, so quit beating yourself up. You're no longer under God's condemnation. He's not mad at you anymore. Get rid of your guilt. It died on the cross with Christ. You are robed in his perfect robe of righteousness. You are forgiven. Have confidence in your God that he did what he said he did in our text. Quit beating yourself up for your sins and for your past. If you are increased, you if you are in Christ, you have been freed. He bore your shame and your guilt. He took your punishment. You are now righteous before Christ, so stop punishing yourself. Do not beat yourself up any longer. You are freed in Christ. Christ has set you free. God's not mad at you anymore. You're not condemned. The third gift is glorification. We see this in part C of our verse. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Glorification is the perfection, the end of our salvation. It's all coming to a, to a point. It's all grown to a head. Believers are now, when we're glorified, we're now in the presence of God. Um, Christ has come back. He has taken his bride home. We have now received our resurrected bodies. We are now like Christ. We are now unable to sin. We love God with our whole hearts, minds, souls, and strength, everything in us. There is no more weakness or sinful flesh, no more suffering, no more bad days, no more tears, no more affliction. We have been glorified in Christ. Our salvation is now complete. Um, the Baptist Faith and Message has a short paragraph. It says, Glorification is the culmination of salvation and is the final, blessed, and abiding state of the redeemed. We are finally redeemed perfectly and wholly and entirely. Salvation is now complete. The redeemed are completely sanctified and Christ is exalted. Mission accomplished. Everything that we have talked about has now finally come to fruition 
all the struggles again are over, all the heartache, all the pain, all the disease, cancer, suffering, all of that is gone. We don't have any need now to be sanctified because we are in God's presence and we are glorified. We have been completely and wholly transformed. Our sinful nature, our sinful flesh is no more. We are now like Christ. God's plan worked perfectly. All right? Why wouldn't it? Why do we doubt now then? Why do we have those bad days and gripe and complain? Because we're being sanctified. We're still in, in the flesh. But what a great salvation. From beginning to end, God puts on display all his attributes. We see his power, his wisdom, his sovereignty, his love, grace, mercy, justice, patience, and he gives us everything that we need. If you go back, if you think back to Genesis 3, everything that Adam lost, we gain in Christ. Every need of ours is is met. When we go back to Edom, Eden, when we remember the great fall, the promises, the curses, now we see the rest of scripture. We see it unfold and not only do we see it unfold, we are part of it. We are involved in God's salvation. He saves us and we have a job to do. We have a responsibility but it, we are involved in this. So when we're reading scripture, when we read in verses 29 and 30, we can say, that's us. That's me. I'm being sanctified. I was called. I'm justified. And one of these days, praise God, I will be glorified. We are involved in this. Now we know um, that we were foreknown by God, predestined for Christ's likeness, called, justified, and will be glorified. We know this because of, of, of what has transpired within us. Our nature has been changed. We're no longer the same people. We know this. We have this knowledge of this. I want you to notice a couple things about our text. All of these are in past tense. I don't know if you noticed that as we read, read this. Um, those he foreknew, he also predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Even glorified is in the past tense. We are not glorified now, but it's in the past tense. Why? Because it is certain. God cannot fail. This is a chain that cannot be broken. Every link in this chain is crucial, and it hangs on the other one. You cannot break it apart. So those whom God loved beforehand, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified will be glorified. Period. That's it. It is so certain. Paul, the Holy Spirit, can communicate it to us in the past tense. We will be glorified. There's no doubt about it. You can bank on it. It is in past tense. It will come to pass because our God cannot fail. This chain will not be broken. It will happen. It's going to happen. That's it. If you've been called, you will be glorified. So, God will begin what, what he began. He will finish and what we have to look forward to is eternal life. It's, it's eternal. It's forever. Um, again, every, everyone he called, he will glorify. And everything in between is for our good and ultimately for Christ's glory. We realize that. So I ask the question again to close. Is this applicable? Is the doctrine of glorification, does it apply to us today? Yes. Why? Because we cannot lose our salvation. We will not lose our salvation. God chose you, and he will glorify you. If you've been called, you will be glorified. You have that hope. You have that assurance. What happens in between, the good, the bad, is all for your growth and ultimately for God's glory. He will bring it to fruition. He will bring it to an end. That also means that we cannot out God's grace. We sin. We feel horrible about it. We repent. And when we wonder, how can God even love me? Am I even called? Am I justified? Am I a believer? If you've been called, if you've been justified, yes, you are not going to be able to out -sin God's grace. Don't try. I'm not, don't, I'm not encouraging you to try. Do not try, but just know that you cannot. There's always more grace. God's grace is efficient, sufficient for us to wash away all of our sin to forgive us. Not only that, secondly, we, when we see our salvation from eternity past in the mind of God, and we think about it in the distant future after the resurrection when we're glorified, when we view it in this way, when we see salvation from beginning to end, when we see this golden chain, we see the links, we know that it cannot be destroyed or broken apart, what does that do for us? 
It makes our present sufferings and afflictions, when we see them from God's perspective, from God's grand purpose, from God's grand and glorious design, it aids us in our pilgrimage. We know that it's for our good. We know that God's going to bring it to, to his desired end. We know that we're being made more like Christ. We know that God's being worshipped. And not only that, when we're going through these things, God can use us in the lives of other believers to minister to them, to help them along on the pilgrimage, to come alongside of them and and put your arm out and drag them even part of the way so they will continue in this, pyramid, this, this pilgrimage. When we view our salvation or, or the trials and temptations and everything that we call bad in this light, it pales in significance to what awaits us. We know that this world is passing. We know that this is for our good and for God's glory. And it's just... I. I know it hurts. I know we, we suffer loss and pain and disease and heartache, and, and it's not easy. I hope I'm not making it sound easy. But we know that that's going to pale in significance to what awaits us in glory. And we know it's for our good. We know that God has a purpose um, for it, and he's conforming us more into the image of Christ. Number three. In the midst of the law, when we think about the entire context uh, of Romans 8, especially um, or the entire book of Romans, and especially chapter 8, we, we see teachings on the law. We see sin, the flesh, suffering, corruption, bondage, weakness, all of these what we would call negative doctrines, all of this sin and just negativity. And we realize it's part of the gospel. We realize it's part of God's um, of his word and even his plan for us. But we can have hope in that. Even with the law beating us up, even in, in turmoil and heartache and bondage and weakness, we of all people, we as Christians have hope because our hope is in God, not in these things, not in our circumstances or our situations. And not only that, we trust God. We trust our God in his providence. We, we have read it. We have seen it. Um, you, you can look at verse 28 in our context. We can trust that God's providence is going to, to accomplish what he plans. Um, again, our good, we are are going to benefit from it and he's going to be glorified we might not understand it we might not be able to explain it it hurts going through it we cannot connect all the dots and all we'll wrap our minds around it but we simply have hope in our God and we trust our God not only that we trust his purposes we trust him at the end of the day it does not matter what is going on around us we trust our God he is he is faithful he is just he is good he is righteous we trust our God and he is worthy of praise. I've said this before, and I'll probably say it again. God is so worthy, all worthy of praise. We could be in hell for a billion years, and God would still be worthy of praise. Our situation, our circumstances, where we're at in life, does not negate the fact that God is worthy of all praise. So, believer, worship this great God who has given us all these wonderful gifts. And sinner, you stand under the judgment of a holy, sin-hating God. I urge you, I beg you to repent and trust in Christ before it's too late. Um, trust in Christ for this gift of salvation that we, we have talked about. Be saved in Christ's name. Do not put it off. If the Holy Spirit is calling you, repent and trust in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we are just indeed grateful that you have blessed us with this gift of salvation. Lord, you had a goal and a purpose in it. We have seen it unfold in Scripture, and we just praise you. You are our God, and you have saved us. Not that we are savable or lovable or did anything to earn it. Lord, you saw us as dead sinners, but yet you set your affection upon us, and we praise you. And not only that, we praise you for bringing it to fruition in time. You have called us and justified us, and we can even say that we're glorified, not yet physically, but we know it is sure. You have promised it to us, and we await it, Lord, and we trust you that you will bring it to pass. Lord, just be with us now. Lord, for the person who does not know you, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would convict, that you would draw, that you would break this person over their sin, that you would humble them, bring them down low, that you might raise them from the dead in Christ. Lord, have your will and your way. We just pray that Christ would be preeminent, Lord, that the Spirit would be heeded. Lord, that the Father, that you would be adored and obeyed and trusted and served and loved. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We pray that you'd write your word upon our hearts. Go with us now, Lord. Continue to humble us and teach us your truths. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
stand with me and sing in Christ alone my hope is found in 506. <laughs> this week to share the gospel, the words to say given to us, and may we proclaim Christ, perhaps see someone turn from their sins and embrace the fullness and newness of life in Jesus Christ. We pray now in Christ's name. Amen. 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 